Hi, I'm Julie Lubinsky, Associate Director of Digital for the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you all to Understanding Medication Series. Uh, today's is, uh, topic is osteoporosis, and it's hosted by Jay Gupta. He is the co-founder of RX Relax and RoboCap, where he focuses on chronic disease prevention and sustainable lifestyle change. So now I'm going to throw it over to Jay. Hello, Jay. Great, Julie. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everybody. I hope you're all doing well with this uh, current situation, and uh, thank you for joining for this important talk about topic of osteoporosis. So today we're going to focus mostly on the medications. Uh, we have two more webinars coming up. One is for the dental care in April, and there will be another one in May for bowel management medications. I did four webinars before. One of them was related to polypharmacy, and people use multiple medications. And there were three webinars related to pain management. So you're welcome to listen to those uh, on ReFoundation's YouTube channel, and you can also find them on ReFoundation's website, which is ChristopherReeve.org. Um, I just was going through the questions you have already sent, and one of the questions was related to uh, pain management. So please uh, uh, follow through that. Uh, those webinars. Uh, so today I won't talk much about the pain management. All right. So we know the assessment and treatment of osteoporosis is essential, uh, but unfortunately not too many people get the proper assessment, particularly after spinal cord injury. Um, I'm going to share the information what we know as of today, uh, but if you're listening to this on a, a YouTube a recorded uh, webinar later on, you may want to check on the updates and do your own research. Throughout this presentation, I'll mostly use the generic names of the medication, but to make it more relevant and make it a little easier for you, I'll also use the brand names. Generic names are really mouthful uh, to pronounce for some of you. Uh, but I'll use the brand name, but I want to make a disclosure here that I have no uh, connection, no financial arrangement with any of the big pharmaceutical companies who manufacture those medications. I've also taken some images from the cyberspace, from the internet, which are not individually acknowledged. And the content of this webinar is only for education and is not to replace your medical care. So if you have any specific question related to your own health, uh, about your own medications, please talk to your own doctor and the pharmacist. So uh, we know that people with spinal cord injury have much higher risk for osteoporosis. So because of that, we'll focus on people with spinal cord injury. Uh, the medicines have not all been tested or clinically tried on people with SCI. So I'll give you some more information which is not specific to SCI, uh, but I'm going to cover overview of osteoporosis with all the pharmacological and some non-pharmacological treatment options. So let's talk about osteoporosis. Uh, it literally means porous bone. So as we age or because of certain medications or certain disease conditions, the bone density starts to go down. And that causes loss of strength and can lead to fractures. So if you look at the pictures of these bones uh, at microscopic level, normal bone has more mineral density than osteoporosis bone. Uh, for human beings, it is said that bone density is supposed to be best around the age of 30, and after that, our bones start to degenerate very, very slow. Incident of osteoporosis actually increases dramatically uh, after menopause for women, and it's connected with hormone, lack of hormone called estrogen. So because of that, more women are affected by, the, by osteoporosis than men do. At, uh, it's an old data. In 2010, there were about 54 million people in America who had osteoporosis or low bone mass or both. When we talk about people who are 50 years old or older, half the women have 
will experience the osteoporosis fracture in their lifetime. And for men, the risk is much lower. It's about 20%. And these fractures, because of osteoporosis, lead to more hospitalization. So we, we do a lot of work trying to avoid uh, strokes and heart attacks, um, but there are more hospitalizations that, hap that happen because of fractures than the strokes, heart attacks, and breast cancer combined. The most common areas for osteoporosis or the fractures are hip, the spine, and the wrist. Other bones can also be at rest, but these three areas are the most vulnerable. Uh, when a fracture happens, uh, of course, this affects the quality of life drastically. Uh, and 20% of the hip fractures are considered to increase the mortality because of the surgery, because of the complications of hip fracture. Uh, so we want to do everything possible to avoid the hip fractures. Um, unfortunately, 80% of those fractures were not tested or treated ahead of time, so that's why it's very important for us to be proactive and making sure that we are being assessed for the fracture risk. So for people experiencing spinal cord injury, uh, it's con osteoporosis is considered a secondary condition and it's an inevitable complication. Uh, so we'll talk about two stages of osteoporosis here. Uh, so first one is acute stage. So within 10 days after spinal cord injury, there's a rapid loss of uh, calcium from the bones. And that rapid loss plateaus between four to 12 months and can take up to two years post-injury. And after that, the chronic stage. So I'm differentiating these two because the symptoms, the medicines we use are a little different in both the stages. In the chronic stage, the uh, bone loss is more gradual. Uh, some people who uh, are para have paraplegia who might gain some movements in their arms and trunks, they start to use them more. Um, so the bone density might increase in arms and trunks in the upper body. Uh, the net effect is 10 to 21% loss of bone by 10 years post-injury. So there's consistently gradual bone loss uh, even after we apply to the acute stage of bone loss for people with spinal cord injury. Now, this is different for different people. So people with paraplegia, for example, might have higher risk of fractures than people with tetraplegia because people with paraplegia are more active. They might be playing sports. They might be more doing more activities. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, so 50, up to 50% of people with chronic spinal cord injuries experience, uh, may experience fractures that result from a fall. Uh, so it can happen with some trauma or it can also be without trauma. Uh, of course, we know it will reduce the independence and it will cause daily activities of daily living might be adversely affected because of those fractures. Uh, after the fracture, you might need a new mobility device or modifications into the, into the devices as well. Uh, with a complete spinal cord injury, uh, more likely to experience fractures than incomplete spinal cord injury of people with non who have no experience of spinal cord injuries. We just talked about paraplegia because of the higher level of function. Uh, people might experience more fractures than tetraplegia. Uh, most common areas of concern would be whole skeletal system, except the skull. Uh, the lower extremities are most affected, uh, followed by pelvis and the arms. So I'm just gonna highlight here the femur, which is the thigh bone, that's the largest bone in our body. And tibia is the shin bone, um, which is the second largest bone. So they are most affected bones um, with osteoporosis. So when it comes to diagnosing osteoporosis, uh, mostly we use uh, radiographic techniques like UCT or DEXA. So DEXA has become kind of a gold standard uh, but we have newer technologies available which can look at microscopic level 
you see there are two kinds of cells in the bone called osteoclasts and osteoblasts. So osteoblasts actually build the bone and osteoclasts help with remodeling and the breakdown of the bones. So some activities go up and some activities go down depending on the injury, depending on the medications we take, depending on the disease conditions we might have. So microscopically we can uh, see those cells much better now, but even now the DEXA is considered the gold standard when it comes to fracture risk assessment. Now the mechanism how osteoporosis is caused with aging or because of neurological conditions uh, or because of bed rest, they're still very different for people who have spinal cord injury. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, most people with SCI, they experience hypercalciuria. Uh, so it is high level of calcium which is released in the urine. So that creates an extra burden for the whole uh, urinary system as well for the kidneys. So hypercalciuria happens 10 days after following uh, spinal cord injury and it peaks during one to six months post injury. So the bones start to break down because of the osteoclastic activity in acute stage of injury. So we are going to talk about acute and chronic stage now. Uh, in acute stage, the osteoclastic activity becomes huge, starts to break down to help maintain repair and remodel, and it resembles the postmenopausal activity, but at a higher magnitude. It also can possibly cause hypercalcemia. So that means there's high level of calcium in the blood as well. So not just urine, but the blood also has high level. And when the high level of blood, high level of calcium is in the blood, that reduces the production of PTH, which is a parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid gland is actually in our throat next to the thyroid gland, which helps in managing the uh, calcium level in our body, and it is an indicator of the bone health as well. So because of lack of the movements in the body and other factors related to spinal cord injury and the muscle weakness, the bone loss also continues to happen in acute stage. Uh, there might be less absorption of calcium from the GI tract during this stage as well. The chronic stage, which is considered after one year of injury, uh, the PTS, the parathyroid hormone level, actually increases. So I'm mentioning this here. Uh, not to make it complicated, but just because we have a medication which increases the PTH level, I just wanted to highlight this difference here. So when the PTH level increases, that can cause loss of more calcium, and we may, might need to supplement the person with calcium at that stage. In chronic stage, also, uh, there's increase in bone mineral density in upper extremities, uh, particularly for the people who have movements uh, in the upper body. So when we start to move the body and we have, uh, we are doing some weight bearing uh, exercises, we are listening to the recommendations from the physical therapist, we are engaged in those activities, the bone density starts to increase. Uh, so vitamin D and calcium, we'll talk more about it a little later, but vitamin D deficiency is actually increased in people with SCI. It could be just because of the injury, it could be more because people become more sedentary and they're not exposed to di direct sunlight. Uh, so bone loss, we know, uh, can happen because of spinal cord injury, but there are a lot of other secondary causes as well. So we don't want to exclude those because when we're trying to build the bones again, we want to probably minimize those secondary causes which uh, can contribute for bone loss. So some of the disease conditions. So this slide has most of the disease conditions which can cause bone loss. Hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, hyper so too much thyroid hormone thyroxine, vitamin D deficiency, hypogonadism, so less activity, endocrine secretions from the gonads, uh, sexual glands, uh, some of the neurological disorders like uh, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, stroke, uh, 
rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, and chylosis, and spondylitis. So I'm not going to read the whole list. So you can go over these diseases. So those diseases also need to be managed much better so that they are not contributing towards the bone loss, towards the osteoporosis. Uh, if you want to listen to more details, you want to read more about those, you can go to National Osteoporosis Foundation website, which is nof.org. This, as a pharmacist, I see more often. So there are a lot of medications out there. This is just a synopsis of, like just a summary of major medications which can cause bone loss, particularly when they are used in higher doses over extended period of time. So if you take any medication, which most people nowadays do, particularly after a spinal cord injury, uh, maybe review your medications with your doctor and the pharmacist to make sure which of those medications might be contributing for contributing to osteoporosis and which medications can be actually tapered off or discontinued uh, while not uh, harming your body with other diseases. So some of them I want to just quickly highlight is uh, uh, aluminum containing antacids. So you might be choosing those over the counter. Proton pump inhibitors are also over the counter. So medicines called omeprazole, uh, the brand name called Prilosec, Prilosec, Naxium. So these are really the worst offenders in general public. Uh, they reduce the absorption of a lot of minerals in the body, including uh, calcium. Some of the antidepressants, some of the anti-seizure medications. Uh, you might be taking steroids like glucocorticoids for uh, pain management. Uh, so all these medications unfortunately contribute to bone loss. So let's jump up, uh, into the treatment modalities now. So first we're going to go through pharmacological interventions, and then we'll talk about non-pharmacological interventions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So American Society for Bone and Mineral Research recommends uh, bisphosphonates. So bisphosphonates can be given orally or intravenously. And some of the medications we have can be given subcutaneously, means under the skin. So oral is by mouth, uh, intravenous is into the veins, Usually it is given by the doctors, and subcutaneous is under the skin, which usually can be uh, given by the patient to themselves. So all these medications are efficacious, but they also have different level of benefits and different level of risks. So this is what we are going to cover in detail today. So oral bisphosphonates, uh, bisphosphonates are considered first line. Alendronate or the Fosamax is one of the oldest medications, uh, which is generally well tolerated, uh, but we're going to cover other medications as well. There's some medications called anabolic agents, so parathyroid hormone. Uh, they're expensive, but for some, medica uh, some patients who are at higher risk or who may not be able to use bisphosphonates, we recommend that medication. Uh, adequate levels of vitamin D and calcium is recommended for everybody. Uh, so we're going to cover that. Uh, and patients being treated uh, for osteoporosis need to be reevaluated for fracture risk. So, so FRAPS, which is the fracture risk assessment tool, needs to be administered, monitored on a regular basis while we are looking at the adverse effects or the side effects of the medicines. So please talk to your healthcare provider on a regular basis, making sure they are doing all the assessments uh, for the fractures as well as bone loss and also co-occurring medical conditions as well as the medicine. So endocrine society, uh, of course, focuses mostly on the postmenopausal women and most of the studies uh, on the medications are also done on postmenopausal women. Uh, so bisphosphonates are recommended for initial treatment uh, and we need to reassess if we need to continue the medicine or not. So reassess for the fracture risk after three to five years, and there's something called bisphosphonate holiday. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So if we give a break to the body for a year or two, uh, if the level, the fracture risk has gone down, the bone density has gone up, at that time it's recommended that we put the person on a holiday for a couple of years. 
All right. So the medications for osteoporosis are, cons- uh, are divided into two categories. First is, one is called anti-resorptives. Anti-resorptives are the medicines which work on osteoclasts. We talked about two kinds of bone cells. One is osteoblast and osteoclast. So osteoclasts are, one, are the ones which reduce, uh, which reduce the activity of the bone or they break down the density of the uh, bones. So anti-resorptives, they slow down the bone breakdown by working on osteoclasts. And anabolics are the ones who work on osteoblasts to stimulate the bone formation. So we have a bunch of medications in anti-resorptive category, and we have only two medications in anabolic category. And then we're going to talk about CoQ10 a little bit as well as other non-pharmacological interventions. So let's talk about bisphosphonates. So these medications have been around for a couple of decades. They have been studied very well in general osteoporosis, and we have some data, some small studies, uh, which indicate that these medications help prevent the demineralization of the bones after spinal cord injury. So these are considered first-line therapy for preventing fractures. Uh, they can lower the risk of hip fracture by up to 50%. So the challenge with most pharmacological interventions is they are pretty good in reducing the risk of the vertebral fractures, uh, but not as much for the hip fractures. But bisphosphonates have, pretty, have a pretty good track record in reducing those fractures. So as I mentioned, these medications inhibit the bone resorption, so they reduce the bone um, loss. Um, they're not working with osteoblasts, so they're less effective for bone formation. So they work the best, they're most effective when they're administered within uh, during the acute phase of spinal cord injury, so acute stage within the first 12 months of after the injury. It's available by mouth with a tablet form as well as intravenous injections. These medications, bisphosphonates, stay in the bones even after you stop taking the medication. So it's normally taken for three to five years, and if the DEXA scan comes out better, the fracture risk assessment tool indicates that there's a lower risk of injury in the next 10 years, you might be eligible for a drug holiday. I actually like to call it a vacation because holidays are usually for one or two days here and there, but vacation would be, you know, much longer. So they, these uh, drug vacations can last for a year or two. So alendronate uh, is the most studied bisphosphonate. It has been found uh, to be effective in uh, preventing bone loss in people with spinal cord injury. It needs to be initiated soon after the injury. Uh, it is usually given in a dose of 70 milligram tablet once a week. Uh, so 70 milligrams once a week, so people will pick a day and it's supposed to be given every week on the same day. Uh, the two-year course of daily alandronate also was shown to prevent the ongoing bone loss in people uh, after spinal cord injury. So mostly, I have not seen a lot of people taking 10 milligram a day. So 10 milligram a day, uh, Fosamax is equal to 70 milligram tablet a week. So people who experience more side effects of the medicine might want to take 10 milligram a day instead of taking once a week. Uh, but it just creates more pill burden on a daily basis, so most people don't like to take it every day. So there are a couple of cautions, something very, very important to remember. If you have been prescribed this medication, uh, you have to take it first thing in the morning. And there are many reasons for that, so let me explain those. So it needs to be taken first thing in the morning with at least six ounces of plain water not the mineral water, not with your coffee or tea, not with juice. And it needs to be taken at least 30 minutes before any food or beverages. So what happens is this medication does not get absorbed well if we take it with juices or mineral water or any other food or medicine. Uh, 
So if you wait for longer time, more than 30 minutes, the drug will be absorbed much better, but we have to watch out for the size. So first thing in the morning, with at least six ounces of plain water and uh, th at least 30 minutes before any food, beverages, or other medications. So that's what the recommendation is. Another most important thing is the person is supposed to stay upright for at least 30 minutes because of the side effects. So we'll talk about that. So dosing can be weekly, daily, or monthly. Most commonly, weekly, uh, the medication called Fosamax or Actonal, the Zandronate and Enandronate, they're prescribed on weekly basis. Evandronate, also called Boniva, is prescribed once a month. And same for Actonal, that can be prescribed daily, weekly, or monthly. The most common side effects because of which people stop using bisphosphonates are related to gastrointestinal tract. So GI side effects are esophageal uh, irrita irritation, that means the food pipe might feel irritated. It can cause abdominal pain, can cause diarrhea, upset stomach, and heartburn. Uh, this medication, this medication group can also cause musculoskeletal pain. So you might have already have pain related to spinal cord injury, but you have to watch for the medication might be causing the pain as well. These medications are associated with jaw osteonecrosis. Uh, means osteonecrosis literally means death of the bone. But what in what these medications do for the jaw, very rarely that the gum may not be covering the whole bone jaw. The so part of the jaw might not be covered with the gums. And it may also cause atypical uh, high fractures. So watching for, uh, let your doctors assess you for those fractures as well. So it needs to be avoided if a person cannot sit upright or, uh, for at least 30 minutes after taking a bisphosphonate. Or the person has a swelling disorder, also, uh, the person's level, blood level of calcium has to be normal. So if a person has hypocalcemia, means less calcium in the blood, this medication needs to be avoided or needs to be given a calcium supplement while taking this phosphonates. This is also not recommended for people who have uh, kidney disease. There's a medication called Reclast or uh, zolandronic acid, which is given intravenously only once a year. So when this medication came out, this was very, very exciting because people don't have to take a medicine every week or every month or even once a day. Uh, and another one which was Boniva three-month injection. So every three months, Boniva can be given. So this definitely improves the adherence, the compliance. Um, it's also very, very convenient for people. Unfortunately, those injectables have much higher risk of side effects. So like osteonecrosis with the oral medication, the risk is considered mm -hmm. less than 1%. But people who get an injectable, the risk can be up to 12%. There's also a high risk of kidney failure and musculoskeletal pain. Uh, with the oral tablets, you can stop taking the medication uh, if you have the side effects. But unfortunately, once you get a reclast injection, uh, it's going to last for about a year. You cannot you know, take it out from the blood. So somebody had asked that question of reclast. I just wanted to highlight that, uh, that remember the side effects and maybe reevaluate with your doctor if you are experiencing any side effects or decline in kidney function. So there was a study done for veterans, specifically for people with spinal cord injury in 2014. Uh, the study was done in people with osteopenia, uh, which is like, uh, People don't have osteoporosis yet, but they're borderline, and also with people with osteoporosis. Uh, oral bisphosphonate was the most frequently prescribed medication in this group. Uh, people who stopped taking the medication was mostly because of abdominal pain. That was the main side effect. Uh, the GI side effects were the most common side effects experienced by this group. Uh, most people did not opt for the drug holiday. It occurred in 14% people, and there were no cases of osteonecrosis. So uh, it is definitely a risk factor, osteonecrosis for the jaw, but it is not. it was not found in this study. Uh, and there was also no case of a typical 
there was one case of a typical family fracture, but that could not be confirmed. So I'm not saying that the side effects will not happen, uh, but we need to monitor that. The second category of uh, medications which I want to discuss is called SERMs, S-E-R-M, Selective Estrogen Receptor Modifier. This uh, group of medication also slows down the breakdown of bones, so they work with osteoclasts. So in this category, we have only one medication called Riloxifene or Evista. So this medication is used in prevention and treatment of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women at high risk of breast cancer who cannot use a bisphosphonate or another medication we're going to talk about in a few minutes called denosumab. This is also recommended for younger women uh, who are less than 60 years old who are at a high risk of vertebral than hip fractures. So remember I mentioned that most medications besides bisphosphonates actually help with the vertebral fractures uh, but not hip fractures. So this medication will uh, work more for the vertebral but not for hip fractures. Also, the post muscle menopause of women who have corticosteroid induced osteoporosis are not able to take the bisphosphonates or other medications. So this medication is reserved only for that um, category of people. So this medicine also may reduce the risk of breast cancer. Uh, again, has been studied only for people, uh, women, who are postmenopausal. This medicine is not usually given or not recommended for people with spinal cord injury because this medicine can uh, the cause risk of thromboembolism. That means a blood clot can happen and travel to other parts of the body, uh, which is already a risk factor after a spinal cord injury. The next category uh, of medication is called calcitonin. calcitonin. So calcitonin nasal spray was available in the two brand names, Fortical and Nicalcin. Uh, so it is used in conjunction with calcium and vitamin D supplementation to treat bone loss in women with postmenopausal osteoporosis. So usually this is given postmenopause uh, at least after five years. So it's not effective if it is given after menopause within first five years. Definitely not a first-line drug and um, just reserved as a kind of last line of therapy when other medications cannot be given. Uh, it does not work for hip fracture and can also increase the risk of cancer in long-term use. Folia or denosumab. So this medication also in the same category of anti-resorptives means it slows down the bone break breakdown, has been shown to reduce the risk of osteoporotic fractures in both men and women. Uh, it is a, a subcutaneous injection. So this injection goes under the skin, just like insulin, but is given only once every six months. So only two injections uh, in one year. It's not the first time it's given to people who have, who cannot take a bisphosphonate uh, or for those who uh, bisphosphonates may not be working. Uh, also, it is much safer for people with reduced kidney function. Uh, it's not recommended for people with uh, stage five kidney disease or people who are on uh, dialysis, but it is still better for people with reduced kidney function. Uh, the effect, once you give a shot, uh, the risk factor for fracture might be maintained for up to two years, even after we discontinue the therapy. Uh, jaw osteonecrosis was higher than bisphosphonates. This is what we found in the research studies. Up to 1.7% patients can experience jaw osteonecrosis. So now we're going to uh, switch gear and talk about the medicine which work with osteoblasts, those small cells in the bones uh, which help uh, building the bone. So these medications are biologics. They are more uh, expensive. They need a septic environment to 
develop. So they cost a lot of money to manufacture, and because of that, they are very expensive as well. So two medications in this category we have are peripretide, also called Fortio, or abalopretide, called Timlos. So these are parathyroid hormone analogs. Uh, so the the price wise, they cost more than twenty thousand dollars a year in America, and I know some audience on that in are tuning from other countries as well. So your pricing might be much different in your country. So this treatment is reserved usually for postmenopausal women with high saturates and only for those who have failed or cannot use other drugs. Uh, it's recommended that we don't use these medications for more than two years. Uh, it's a daily subcutaneous, subcutaneous injection. Uh, if this has been prescribed for you, the most important thing to remember is if you forget the injection one day, do not try to catch up. So that means uh, you cannot get two shots uh, next day if you missed today's dose. So just forget it and moving on. And I'll give you share a tool with you which will help you remind taking your pills on a regular basis um, to an app. So teripretide, the Fortio is the older medication in this category. Uh, it used, needs to be used with caution in moderate kidney impairment, and it can cause leg cramps. The Timlos came, I think, just about two years back, and it has kind of uh, a wide variety of side effects, so, which includes abdominal pain, orthostatic hypotension, which means if you suddenly get up, your blood pressure might suddenly drop, um, dizziness, fatigue, headaches. So watch out for the side effects. And I also strongly recommend for every medication, uh, but particularly for these medications, if you're taking them and your pharmacist is, gives you a medication guide, a couple of pieces of papers which come in the bag, please read those uh, so that you can be more educated about the possible side effects and can have a more uh, educated conversation with your doctor or the pharmacist about reducing those side effects. Injection site reactions are also more common with Timlos. Uh, the next category of medicine in um, anabolics is sclerostin inhibitor. The good uh, thing about this category of medication is that it works on both building the bones as well as slowing down the breakdown of the bones. So it works with both osteoblasts as well as osteoclasts. Uh, so this is the generic name called Romosozumab. Uh, the brand is, is Avenity. I have never dispensed it in my practice because uh, I don't think anybody was eligible for this medication. Uh, so this also, this medication also helps with both vertebral as well as the hip fractures. Uh, it was found in a study to be better than alendronate only group, uh, studied in postmenopausal women with high fracture risk, and also in women who failed. Uh, with bisphosphonates or cannot use other agents. So this is given as two injections every month for a year. So that means you get 24 shots in a year and two injections are given on the same day right after one another. Uh, person needs to be supplemented with vitamin D and calcium during the treatment because it's anabolic, it's gonna build the bones. So if you don't have enough vitamin D and calcium, it's not going to help. Uh, this medication needs to be avoided in hypocalcemia and people who have a heart condition. So if there's a cardiovascular risk factors involved, it needs to be avoided. Some of the side effects are joint pain and increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular health, uh, cardiovascular death. So uh, just watching out for that, that's why these medications are serious medications. They can be very, very beneficial but because of the risk profile, we need uh, a prescriber to make a risk-benefit analysis with you and making sure that you take it uh, and extract the most benefit from the medication and reduce the risk factors. These medications are possibly not effective after five years post-injury. So in the acute stage of injury, as well as uh, 
one year after the injury, like in the chronic stage, but before five years, these medications are possibly going to be more effective. Just to quickly talk about supplements. Uh, so this supplement is, uh, besides vitamin D and calcium, is the most popular, has been very well documented. A lot of people talk about it, and people you might be even using it. So there are some publications, particularly in animal models, have been shown uh, to reduce the bone loss. But it has not been studied in uh, human beings. Uh, so coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10 is a natural antioxidant which is produced by the body. Okay, it's also available in our food items in small food in small amounts, and is also available as a supplement. So level of CoQ10 decreases as we get older, and it can reduce with certain health conditions and medications as well. So it has been uh, studied for heart conditions, for Parkinson's disease, for migraines for statin-induced myopathy, uh, statins are medications for cholesterol, but the evidence is inconclusive, and American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guidelines do not recommend CoQ10 at this time. From my perspective as a pharmacist, what I recommend is if you feel like you want to start using CoQ10, please speak to your physician as well as your pharmacist. So they, they can monitor you for potential drug interactions. So when we take two medications, they interact with each other. So there are several cautions uh, with several category of medications uh, when you take coenzyme Q, uh, Q10. So thyroid medications, chemotherapy, uh, the cancer medications, uh, these medications, uh, CoQ10 might blunt or amplify the effect of your blood pressure medication, your diabetes medication, but the most serious is that uh, CoQ10 can make your uh, anticoagulants, the medication which reduce the blood clot possibilities in your body, it might make them less effective. So if you're on Coumadin or aspirin to reduce the uh, risk of blood clots, they may not work as good, thereby increasing the risk of blood clots. So watch out for that, and please discuss that with your doctor and the pharmacist. So some of the side effects are uh, abdominal pain, rashes, diarrhea, nausea, dizziness, and loss of appetite, not recommended in children and people who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Uh, just a reminder for everybody, I'm not against supplements. I personally love supplements, provided we know how they work and what are their side effects. Unfortunately, these supplements are not approved by FDA and they have not been as uh, vigorously studied as the pharmacological have been studied. So with the <clears throat> pharmacological interventions, with the medicines, we know what is good about them and what is not so good about them. With supplements, the data is not very conclusive. So vitamin D and calcium definitely recommended. They are uh, essential for everybody uh, for building and keeping the bones strong and uh, high density of minerals. Uh, so there are several studies uh, which show actually that people with spinal cord injury probably do not get enough vitamin D and calcium from the diet. So for healthy people, it's recommended that they get the vitamin D and uh, calcium from their diet or from the sun, but it's uh, in people with spinal cord injury, it may not be possible. So supplementation might be recommended if your blood levels indicate that. Uh, people with spinal cord injury might also have less absorption or malabsorption of uh, vitamin D from the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So watching out for that. People who are treated with glucocorticoids, which many people with spinal cord, cord injury might be, uh, they should receive adequate amounts of calcium and vitamin D as a supplement. Uh, this, one of the studies in JAMA last year indicated that it can reduce uh, the hip fracture risk by 16%, and definitely you don't want to overdose on these supplements either. If there's a high amount of calcium in your blood, 
it will be filtered through the kidneys into your urine, creating more burden on your kidneys. And same is true for vitamin D. So according to this journal uh, of American Medication Medicine Association last year, it says taking more than your physician recommendation uh, may be associated with uh, bone, mass, bone mineral density declines. So it can actually harm you instead of benefiting you from the bone mineral density perspective. So deep prescription, I briefly talk about that in uh, almost every talk I have given so far. Uh, it's a newer concept. Uh, we went through a slide in which we talked about which medications can possibly cause or increase the risk of bone loss. So please discuss those uh, medications with your doctor and see if they can be discontinued or tapered off or at least reduce the dose of those medications. So PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors used for <clears throat> hyperacidity, uh, you might be using them over the counter. Um, so you can, don't stop using those medications, discuss with the doctor and the pharmacist before you do that. SSRIs are antidepressants and glucocorticoids are the steroids which we use for pain and inflammation. So we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna briefly talk about non-pharmacological interventions. So physical therapy. So physical therapy and physical exercise are recommended as soon as possible. So most people work with a physical therapist, so please follow their guidelines. It has been found <clears throat> that isometric exercises double the uh, rate of blood flow in the femoral vein. So we measure the blood flow in the femoral vein, bone because it's the largest bone. So uh, isometric exercises, weight-bearing exercises, the functional electrical stimulation, and whatever your physical therapist recommends you, please follow that advice. Uh, some fractures have been treated surgically, uh, which is kind of a newer concept. Uh, it is kind of increasing in number now, uh, with the outcomes are compared to, to the uh, pharmacological interventions. Uh, also, learning and using safe techniques for transferring in and out of wheelchair, and also during the sport. So whatever activities you're doing, making sure they're not just effective, uh, they're also very safe. So I uh, teach, uh, for example, therapeutic yoga, where we emphasize on safety more than the activity. So we do the activities, making sure it is safe and not gonna cause a fracture. There are certain lifestyle changes you can make for yourself. Um, so that I'm gonna highlight for a, in a minute. Uh, so smoking. Smoking is a known risk factor for osteoporosis. So if you're using tobacco products or smoking, if you can avoid it, or at least use some pharmacological and non-pharmacological help, whatever your provider can help you with, please consider doing that. Uh, drinks, uh, hard liquor as well as the soft drinks, both are known to reduce the bone density. The soft drinks have something called phosphoric acid. So phosphates and calcium, it will just help leach the calcium more from the bones. So they, are, they need to be avoided if you have been uh, diagnosed with osteoporosis or you're at high risk of fractures. There are certain chemicals which are in small quantities in our personal care products which are set to impact our bone density. Some of them are, one of them is triclosan. So triclosan was actually banned from hand sanitizers because that was available in all antibacterial soaps and hand sanitizers, also in some of the toothpaste. So read the small print, look at the labels um, in your personal use products, uh, personal hygiene products. If there's any triclosan, avoid that. Uh, some products might contain arsenic. Uh, some products contain uh, endocrine disruptors like bisphenol or parabens. Uh, these products are still allowed in the products. Uh, so if you can somehow avoid those, that will be good choices if you are at high risk for uh, osteoporosis or fractures. So just a quick summary, uh, what we just talked about. Uh, 
communicating with your physician and the pharmacist, know them well. So I know pharmacy business is in, in a flux. A lot of medications are being mailed to people. Uh, people are buying medicines from multi-pharmacies, which just adds to the confusion, increases the drug-drug interaction. But if you know at least one pharmacy that you can go, or at least by phone, you can check all about your medication. That will be awesome. Make sure at least one pharmacist who is monitoring your medicine has a list of all the medications you take, uh, including over-the-counter medications and the supplements. Uh, using uh, the medications as they are prescribed, so following the dosage recommendations. Uh, some people don't take medicines every day because they're trying to save money or they forget to take medications. So please discuss that with your provider. Uh, don't do that on your own. Get a full medication therapy management session. So MTM is covered by uh, Medicare Part D uh, for people who are older adults, 65 plus, and also people who have uh, different abilities. So reviewing all the medication, so medication therapy management sessions will include the review of all your medications, what medication can be increased, reduced, managing the side effects of the medications, uh, particularly the side effects which can reduce the bone density. So all that can be identified by your pharmacist uh, if you go through that medication therapy management session. Knowing your medicines, so I know they're very difficult to pronounce sometimes if you're getting an alendronate or uh, stuff like that, but understand the medication and read the literature. Uh, uh, literature changes, the studies come out all the time, so staying current on the warnings. So please read uh, the flyer you receive from your pharmacist every time you refill the medication. There's an app, which is a free app, Know Your Match, so you can actually put all your medications in without putting your personal data, excuse me, your name and stuff, uh, which will give you reminders on what time to take the medicine and if there's any drug interaction which you need to be concerned about and discuss with your doctor. Uh, so we talked about what other medications might be promoting bone loss, uh, the safety and the risk of avoiding the risk of fall. So if you are lightheaded or if you are drowsy or dizzy because of other medications you take. Sometimes antihypertensives can do it, benzodiazepine, which are anxiety medications, uh, the pain management medications. So any medication which can reduce your blood pressure drastically or can cause dizziness will increase the risk of fall and risk the increase of fractures. So please be aware of, mindful of those medications as well. Storing and disposing of medications appropriately, that goes without saying. Uh, making sure nobody has access to your own medications. Uh, follow the guidelines for disposing of safely if you're not using that medication anymore. Side effects reporting. Unfortunately, this does not happen as often as it's supposed to happen. So if you're experiencing a side effect, uh, which even if you're not sure if it is because of medicine X or medicine Y, uh, you're welcome to report that to FDA. FDA has a good system to identify which medicine is connected with the side effect. And if enough number of people report the side effects, that's when it comes into the warnings. Uh, um, you can report those side effects uh, by calling what 800 FDA 1088, or you can do it online as well on their website. Okay, it seems my uh, slides are acting out like that. And talking about non-pharmacological interventions. And we have a few minutes for your question and answer. And I really appreciate that you joined this call uh, in this time. And I'm gonna start taking the questions, so please start typing them. I'm gonna start with the first one. Is DEXA scan a reliable source for a clinician to make a decision about potential fracture risk to a patient? I'm a physical therapist and I get people walking in a robotic device. So thank you so much. This is a physical therapist from Cornell. So I appreciate that you get people walking on a robotic device. Uh, I'm not an expert with the diagnostics, but my understanding is DEXA is still the gold standard. But besides DEXA, uh, there's a whole risk assessment tool, FRAX, 
the fracture risk assessment tool. This is what the providers use to assess, uh, just to predict the 10-year risk of fractures. I am on a yearly reclast injection. What are the advantages, disadvantages? So I went in detail through that. So there's definitely an advantage of this injection because you're using it only once a year and you can forget about it. But we talked about the disadvantages mostly connected with the uh, side effects of the medicine. Uh, there's a very specific question about multiple health conditions and pain management, extreme pain. Uh, so I would recommend listening to the uh, webinars I did about pain management, about the opioid medications and uh, uh, non-pharmacological interventions for pain management. Um, the next question is about uh, C5, 6 squared, osteoporosis in hip joints. So that's a great question. So I, uh, it's all about the medications we just covered. The question is about a bisphosphonate and a 4 and a reclass. So I'm glad the person is getting better. And whatever options I just shared with you uh, uh, related to personal care products and non-pharmacological interventions, if you can add that, that hopefully will also help your slowing down the osteoporosis. The next question is, uh, uh, is it true that people with spinal cord injury will immediately be, will be diagnosed with osteoporosis? Uh, so as we discussed in the beginning of this presentation, that's very normal that people will lose the bone density. Uh, so please uh, discuss with your doctor, make sure that you have the diagnosis and the treatment properly. So our time is up. My presentation is giving me some warnings here. Uh, Julie, is it okay to continue with these questions or should we answer these questions later on by uh, emailing them? Um, you, you, if you have five minutes, you can um, certainly go over for five minutes. Okay, thank you, Julie. All right. Uh, the next question is about uh, alcohol contributing to osteoporosis. Uh, there's not a lot of data, but uh, the general data indicates alcoholic beverages and soft drinks contribute to osteoporosis. Uh, are the side effects of a medication, what's the benefits? Uh, I would recommend that this having that discussion with your provider. Every medicine has side effects and adverse effects. So the biggest thing which the doctors do is uh, taking a whole inventory of risk and benefits. So if the benefits are more than the risk, then yes, that's when the doctors are supposed to prescribe you medication, and I hope that's what your doctor does as well. Uh, next question is about uh, exercising, standing frames, standing wheelchairs. Will they reduce the osteoporosis? There's a high possibility of that. Any movement, any exercise, particularly weight-bearing exercises or isometric exercises, are considered helpful. But I'll definitely discuss that with a physical therapist because this is what their expertise is. I'm gonna skip some of the questions which I have already covered in the presentation. Uh, so one of the questions is that this, the person has heard that bisphosphonates actually rid the bones of strength after one stops taking it. I have not heard of that. So once people stop taking the medicine, uh, after three to five years, uh, what I talked about, bisphosphonate holiday, that's a very common practice, but it depends on how your body does, body responds to bisphosphonates. Uh, sometimes we get a, give a break from bisphosphonate because of the side effects of the medicine, but we might continue the person on another medication from a different category uh, if the, uh, the scans are indicating that bone strength has not uh, come to normal or the acceptable level. Yes, certain 
questions about uh, health conditions, which I'm not an expert with, I would defer those personal questions, specific questions to your own doctor and your own physical therapist. Uh, somebody's asking, can we get the, uh, the slides? Yes, this presentation will be available on the website, ChristopherReeve.org, as well as on the Reef Foundation's uh, YouTube channel. And Julie can give you the links later on, but by Googling it, you can just actually find it. Somebody got a medication for osteoporosis, but osteoporosis got worse. Uh, what can we do? I would recommend asking the doctor if we can switch the medication from a different category. Uh, so if somebody got bisphosphonate, but that was not working or osteoporosis got worse, we have other options. That's what we went through today. Thank you for your questions. It's amazing questions. I really, really appreciate those questions. And I hope I covered almost all of them. I'm just quickly scanning through questions. I'm on question number 17 right now. Uh, there's a question about hormone therapy. I'm going to skip over that as well. I would speak to an endocrinologist about the Hormone therapy, it is very controversial to give hormone therapy just because of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. Uh, that's why I went through osteoporosis medication, not about the hormones here. There are some insurance questions, of course. I'm sorry, I can't answer those questions right now. Uh, How can I get a copy of slides? So these slides will be available on uh, the YouTube as well as the foundation website. <clears throat> Is swimming as good as walking or biking to help prevent bone loss? I would say probably no, but if swimming is the only thing you can do, or if you're doing any exercise in the water because you cannot do the exercise on land, uh, I would say please continue doing that. Uh, yes, any exercise is better, but I don't think we have any data which will compare uh, one exercise as compared to the other exercise. So we know isometric exercises as well as uh, weight-bearing exercise are, exercises are known to improve the bone health. I have a very good question here. Uh, uh, racial differences, can that make any difference from one treatment to another? There is a possibility, uh, but unfortunately, when we do the clinical trials, the large trials do not include everybody. Uh, so they are kind of biased uh, to some extent, uh, but off lately in the last couple of years, we are doing a lot more genetic testing, and we are learning that some people are fast metabolizers or slow metabolizers, of certain medications. So we're learning that medicines may or may not be as effective or might cause more side effects uh, because of our genetic makeup. So there's a specific question about uh, talking to the doctor. Yes, I would uh, refer to doctor's recommendations. Uh, whether you should get DEXA after three years or after four years or five years. <clears throat> There's some more questions about hormones. I'm gonna skip over that because we wanted to target osteoporosis today in spinal cord injury. Uh, Oh, this is great. 31 questions. I really, really appreciate. Uh, so if you have any more questions, you're welcome to post your questions when the Reef Foundation publishes this presentation on YouTube channel. 
and I'll do my best to get back to you. Thank you so much, and uh, I hope to see you next month when we talk about the dental care and the medicines with dental care.